by the head of this body. And we give everything to you, Lord God. We give it all to you, Lord. We lay everything down, all of our plans, all of our thoughts, our emotions. We give it all to you, Lord God. Because you are the awesome way maker. You always make a way for each one of us because we are your body. And we thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here with us today, that you lead us and guide us. And we thank you for the word that our pastor will bring today that will cause us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you, we bless you, we praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, sweet Josephine. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> well, we want to welcome everyone. We have any new timers? Just old timers. <laughs> we have any new? All old? But we are young in the Lord, right? In eternity, we are so young. Hallelujah. Well, welcome. First time visitors, we have none. We have all family here, so praise the Lord. Uh, for Facebook, if you are new, if you're a new timer or an old timer, let us know in the chat. And we welcome everyone. Our National Day of Prayer, May 4th at 7 p.m. right here at church. I say it each week. One can put 1,000, two can put 10,000. We need to put hundreds of thousands to flight. Amen? Amen. Yes, so that's what we're about to do. And um, it's a National Day of Prayer. It's a world day of prayer. We all have to be praying for the whole world, but especially for America and as we see what's going on in our country. We need, we need God to move, to really move upon our government, upon the people that are so deceived, and we need to pray for that. So in Jesus' name, you be here May 4th, 7 p.m. Amen. Um, you can watch our pastor's teaching in Revelation every Tuesday, or you can attend, which is way better if you attend <laughs> instead of just watching. But if you can't, then just watch uh, 9.30 for Our Lady, 7 p.m. for everyone. Facebook Live comes on around 9.30, quarter to 10. Uh, we have our um, special couple here, Nancy and Jim Capagna. Jim is going through open heart surgery on Monday. So um, we're going to be praying for him. But we have a card to sign back where Marge is. So please take the time and write him a little note. Give him some encouragement from the Lord and from you. We, I don't know who all knows Bill and Linda Stahl. Good, several. So uh, they have some challenges. And we thought it would be really awesome to make some meals and bring them to them. So if you would uh, and are able, then sign up. We have a sign-up sheet where Marge is. Just sign up, and then we'll be able to get in touch with you and be able to get in touch with them as to what you're bringing and when you're bringing it. Amen? And also, on Mother's Day, we are starting our baby bottle drive for choices of the heart. So you remember, you save all your change, you take a bottle home, you fill it up, and you bring it back, and then you can take another one, too. Fill them all up, bring them back. So uh, make sure that you're saving, and then pick up your bottle on Mother's Day. Amen? Our giving platforms are text to give covenantmessiahcom slash donate. You can mail your offerings to that post office box number or place them in the basket that Sandy holds up before the Lord. So if you'll all stand with me for a moment. Thank you, Father God, for the privilege of coming into your throne of grace. How awesome it is to be in your presence, O Lord. We thank you that you pour out your blessings upon us. We thank you, Father God, that we can take our tithes and our offerings and offer them up and give to you, Lord God, what you have required of us. And then you're able to bless it. Jesus always breaks it, multiplies it, and sends it forth, Lord God, and so that we have great harvest. Thank you for each and every giver. We thank you, Father God, for every person that continually gives into this ministry, knowing that it is good seed, a good ground that the seed is 
uh, goes through and grows and multiplies. So we bless you and thank you. And right now we lift up uh, Jim Campania, and we thank you, Father God, that you go before him. You are his rear guard. You surround him with angels, and he goes through this heart surgery knowing that you are right there leading and guiding the surgeon's hands, Father. We thank you for a God report, and we bless Linda and Bill Stahl, Father God, that in these health challenges that you have made a way. You are the way maker, and you have made a way for total healing and manifestation to come to them. In Jesus' precious name, amen, and you may greet one another.
Okay, my family. Wow, I'm loud in here today. Woohoo! It is, isn't it? Yes. No sleeping during this sermon, I'll tell you that. Uh uh. Lara, how are you? Sleepy? Are you just, you worked all night? Well, just feel free to stand. And I'll say amen when you do it. All right, family, I'm going to ask you to take your lovely seats. Or else I'm going to send Carol and Jill after you down your row. Yes. The front row security. Yes. How are we doing today? <laughs> How are we doing today? It is so good to be back together in our favorite book by our favorite author, right? It's not only our favorite book, but it's the author that makes it so very special. Amen. Good to be here. Diane, I ran into her in Walmart the other day. Yeah, we just run into people all over the place, right? Um, I don't know about you, but I, you know you got a word from the Holy Spirit when the person teaching the message is still meditating on the message. Because I will tell you, last week, I just think the Lord just gave us a whole bucket full of revelation and things to think about and things to meditate on and just ponder about with that man at the pool of Bethesda. I mean, the way he took that angle and just had us see some different things. And again, just reminding if you weren't here, please listen to the message. It's a keeper. I have to tell you, I'm still, I'm still looking at my notes and the Lord's still downpouring stuff into me that the fact that he, his whole identity just became this map. It's who he actually become. And guess what? It's a message for us because it's so easy to identify ourselves with things that we're used to experiencing. It becomes the very person we are. I'll tell you, it's, it's, a, it's something really to ponder in our own life. So we found out last week from the study about this man at the pool that God wants him up and at him and moving. Amen? Moving forward, right? He wants us all moving forward. A new day is coming, a new place for you to be. It's always, he's always bringing new things into our lives, and that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. I want to just take a moment and thank many of you who not only took the time to reach out this week, um, but some of you just grabbed me by the hand, grabbed Ray, and just prayed for us. And I just really just can't tell you how much that touched our heart and um, as we're about to embark on this new adventure. So, so many of you just really blessed us, and I just really give you thanks for that. If you weren't here last week, we probably need to connect so you know what I'm talking about. So feel free. We can have a chat after the service. Um, I also put together last Tuesday a few words on some paper um, just to kind of take with you on the details of what's going to happen going forward on Sundays and Tuesdays. Marge has them back there. Sure, she'll be glad to give you one of those. And um, it's all good. Jesus, take it all, right? That's what we're supposed to be. We're just sojourners and pilgrims on his roads and what he wants us to do. So anyway, uh, let's take a peek of where we were last week. I want to draw your attention to the screens as we do that. Shalom. I have a question for you. Pardon me. I don't have many answers, but I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains.
Pastor, I have no one to help me into the water when it's that dark. And when I do get wet, all the others, they step down in front of me. And so... Okay, come on. Look at me. That's not what I ask. I'm not asking you about who's helping you or who's not helping you or who's getting in your way. I'm asking about you. <laughs> I tried. For a long time, I know. You don't want false hope again, I understand. nothing for you. It means nothing. And I know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need your mask and walk. Free to walk, like you said. Don't forget your bed. Why does this matter? Because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Everything changed now. Amen. Well, we decided that uh, he wasn't going to make any room for any regression, right? No relapses when Jesus touches our life. I just love that. Just beautiful. But I want to ask you, did you notice who was lurking in the background? <laughs> two, two little shots we got just to look at who was just kind of lurking in the background. Let's pray. And we're going to just pick up right there, okay? Father, we come, we come into your presence in the mighty matchless name of the name above every name that is named, our healer, our deliverer, our savior, our Lord. Lord, I ask that um, you would open up our hearts along with the Bibles that we brought with us today. Show us Jesus. Show us depth in Jesus. Show us him in a new and living way in this hour that we have together. How he thought, what he said, his compassion, how he handled misinformation. We give you, Lord, our hearts and our minds this morning and we ask that you would conform your ways to our ways and that we would have your way in our lives today in jesus precious name everyone said amen, amen. touch your neighbor and say wakey wakey. Wakey, wakey, wakey make sure they have their mat with them today <laughs> amen all right we're going to pick right up where we left off in verse 10 and 11 let's find out who was lurking as this miracle was taking place the jews Therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, 
take up your bed and walk. I am absolutely amazed as we even start down this journey today into the remainder of chapter five, because, you know, like put yourself in this place. If I saw or we saw a lame man for almost four decades, 38 years, standing up and walking, probably leaping, wouldn't you be leaping? I think I might say, oh, wow, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Not, it's not lawful. It's not lawful is exactly what was said. Religious spirits and legalism are just the worst. They are just the worst. The critical spirit that's upon someone with a religious spirit and legalistic tendencies always is looking for some way that we're messing up. And it's rooted in the enemy. It certainly is rooted in the enemy. The word says, keep the Sabbath. It certainly did say that. Do no customary work. Uh, This was Old Testament specific, of course. So sadly, through the years, Jewish leaders, rabbis and one night, they added to the written commandment. Because no one knew really what customary work was. It wasn't defined in the Old Testament that way. So what they did is they added something called the oral law that was added to the written commandments, and they decided. Bad news right from there. As soon as man starts deciding what God means with certain things, you know you're in a, you're in a, a bad situation. They decided that there would be 39 activities that a person could not do on the Sabbath and label it customary work that shouldn't be done. For example... This is how ridiculous this got. You could not look in a mirror on the Sabbath. Some of us don't want to look in a mirror any other day, but anyway, we'll we'll leave that go. Yes, you could not look in the mirror on the Sabbath. Why? Because if you saw the gray hair, you might want to pull it out, and that would be customary work that shouldn't be done on the Sabbath. Let me can can we go a little deeper and more real? If you were a denture, and yes, they had them then. I don't even ask me the details of that. I don't know. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't wear a denture because it might fall out, which I'm sure that would be a problem back in that day. They would fall out, and you would need to bend over to pick it up. Therefore, you would be doing customary work. So I could go on and on. There were so many ridiculous things that they began to, like Jesus said, you put yokes on people that you yourself cannot even hold and bear up, right? So what was happening? So the rest, which is what Shabbat Shalom was supposed to be, Sabbath rest, the rest became unrest working about what rest was supposed to be. So the rest they were supposed to have became worry, anxiety, and a bunch of man-made traditions, which again is why Jesus said man-made traditions, they just do away with the power of God, right? So back to the story, rather than be elated, what did these guys do? They criticized this miracle that took place at the pool. I'm telling you, maybe you already know, the most vicious people I have ever known are legalists. They're, they're, they... They just exclude anything good and focus on what is negative and actually are looking for it. That's exactly what they do. Let's see what happens over in verse 12 and 13. Then they asked him, who is this man who said this to you? Take up your bed and walk. But the one who was healed did not know who he was. I shouldn't say it was, who he was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So he kind of just kind of mingled and, and went along the ground. And you could see in the show, I thought they did a good job of saying, who? He was going to ask him, who are you, I believe, and never got to say that because Jesus just kind of scurried off there. So Jesus didn't heal him and then hand him a business card saying, oh, by the way, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. You probably haven't heard of me, but I am Messiah. And he didn't hand out anything to let him know that, okay? But they would meet again. This wouldn't be the only time. Verse 14 tells us that very thing. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, this is a very interesting piece of scripture because, you know, again, legalists can go somewhere with this. 
that if you have any sickness, you must be a sin. And that, isn't that what Jesus dealt with even in his time walking? Who sinned, the mother or the father, with the boy that was, I think he was a demonic or something. So, yes, yeah, so there's, there's places we can go with that. But I want to start off from the beginning before we address that. Jesus found him at the temple. Can I just say, we, don't, we didn't find Jesus. He was never lost. He finds us, and when he finds us, what that means is are we willing to be found? He knows where we are. He doesn't not hide and seek, but sometimes people aren't willing to be found. And I love the fact that this man went to the temple. It's one of the first things he does after his healing. Probably, we don't know, word doesn't tell us, but probably to give God thanks for what is taking place here. Again, let me remind you, it's been four decades, just short of four decades, that he has been dealing with this infirmity. This might, we don't know, this might have been even the first time he's ever been at the temple. We don't know when this infirmity took place. We don't know what the situation behind it was. We don't know what the sin that's being talked about is. But he is at the temple with Jesus, and Jesus says, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. So let's take a moment and look at that. Just a thought here. Does all sickness, can we attribute all, all sickness, comes from a result of sin? No. In a way, yes. And the way I mean by that is it came from the original sin. It came from the Adamic curse. So in a sense, yes. In a sense, yes, it does. Because there was no sickness, infirmity, or disease in the Garden of Eden. It was when the curse of Adam and Eve came upon that area that, that sin And not only the the nature of sin, but also sickness and disease came also. So sickness is a part of the Adamic curse. That's what it's a result of. However, not only that, but sickness can come from personal sin. We can't say it never does because sickness personally can personally come from sin. Let me give you an example, and I'm sure you could probably add to just the one I have here. HIV, hepatitis B and C are very common in drug use. It's, you know, infections because of shooting uh, up, you, you know, intravenous shoot. Those things can come absolutely from sin. Why? And, and in this case, Jesus recognizes. He, he says something about the sin. We don't know what it is, but we know this. Sin cripples, destroys, and can make lame. That is for sure. So apparently there was something in this man's life that had a sin root to it. I don't think we need to take this and make it a collective statement that everything here that we ever experience is because you've got sin in your life. Amen? In fact, let me take it a little deeper, knowing that, uh, that ultimately it comes from the Adamic curse and knowing that the second Adam came to bring what? To, to do away with that curse, to bring the blessing of Abraham onto our life. We ought to come against sickness and disease in a believer's life. Because we've been renewed into the new man, similar to where Adam was before the Adamic curse took place. I have to tell you, that statement is a real separation between a lot of teachings and a lot of churches. Because you, so there's some pulpit you will hear, well, you know, you don't ever know what God's going to do. God doesn't u- need to use tuberculosis for you to have a relationship with him. And this is how the silliness of some of this discussions that take place. When we really understand... What Jesus did, Jesus paid for the sin that Adam opened the door to and the curse that came with it. He redeemed us back to that original place. If we're a believer, we don't have to wait to go to heaven to receive the blessing of Abraham and the blessing of the Lord in our lives. We're supposed to walk in newness, a new creation, not the old man, because the old man is related to the Adamic curse. We are new in Christ, therefore we need to read this word and get this new, renewed mind so that we know what we should be believing for and what we should be aiming at. Amen? Are you with me with that? Just wanted to clear that up because it's one of those sentences that can make it look like, well, this is, you know, we can take all this and this applies to everyone at all times, and it doesn't. Verse 15 and 16 tell us this. The man departed, and he told the Jews that it was Jesus, because obviously Jesus finds him in this temple, and obviously he finds out his name at that point, and he departs, and he tells the Jews that it is Jesus who made him well. Verse 16, for this reason, 
if you have your Bible open, you really ought to underline this. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the very Sabbath. This, the reason I say underline that is because this scripture right here, verse 16, is a turning point in Jesus' ministry. It's an absolute turn the table time because from this miracle on, they will be on his trail to attempt to, to, to kill Jesus. In fact, the word persecute here in verse 16 in the Greek grammatical language literally means to persecute and to persecute some more and to continue to persecute ongoing and increasing as time goes on. So this is a very key moment that's taking place here. And I think you're going to see as we get through now the rest of the chapter why he does what he does, which is now going to be explained who he is to them. Because the ante's up now. You know, he, 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 they're, they're after him big time. He's going to give them a reason to be after them. Verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Now, 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 if you have in your, you know, let me just ask, if you have uh, your Bible open and you have a red letter edition, how many have that? Do you notice what's going forth down the page now, almost to the end of the chapter, to the end of the chapter? It's all red letter. Yeah. It's all red letter from here on out. Jesus is now going to give a discourse, and he's going to give a discourse about who he is. And he's going to give it to the very ones who are, remember, persecuting and going to continue to persecute and going to persecute deeper and higher than they've ever done. But it didn't stop him from still stating who he was. Amen? I just wonder how many of us are afraid to even go out and say something about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because of persecution. Jesus didn't, did not stop. He wasn't uh, stabilized. He wasn't held back just because some people didn't like what he was saying. In fact, all the more they were the ones who needed it because what did he say? I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick. And these guys were going to be you know, studying a little bit for the next two weeks. These guys, they had every jot and tittle and held everybody to every jot and tittle. Yet when the living, breathing word of God, the living word stood before them, they had no no revelation of who he was. It just goes to show you, you can know some things about the Bible and not know the author. You can know some scripture. You can, this is what the Pharisees were all about. They knew the word. They could quote gobs and gobs of, 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 of scripture. Yet when Jesus, the word, stood before them, they were clueless, absolutely clueless. So when we go to our word every day, realize you're going to the author. We're not going to get intellectual assent and, and have just some things that, that are a gift that make us feel good. We're going there to learn of him, to be, to, for, for him to be known and us to be known by him. Amen? Important thing for us to realize, very important thing is to, for us to realize. So it's a turning point, again, because in this miracle, they are going to trail him. They are going to be on him actually to kill him. And in this red letter portion that you have before you, we are going to see and study together for the rest of our time today and even a little bit next week, the discourse on who he is, on his identity. If this was a course in theology, there's many different things you can study in theology, but if this was a theology course, we would call it Christology. That's what this section of scripture would be. Christology is, guess what you think? Ology means study of, so what's it a study of? Christ. So in theological terms, we're going to do a Christology study for the rest of today. So just now, and just know that uh, we could spend several weeks on this section. Honestly, there is so much in here from a theological standpoint that we could take almost a verse and a section at a time and just dig and go very deep. But we're not going to do that because since Jesus did it all in one sitting, I think I can do it too. Let, let's just say maybe two, maybe two. It's been said, it's been said 
before we even start unraveling this. I don't know who said it, but it's a very famous saying. It's been said that Jesus Christ, what are you going to do with his name? We are going to give an account for what we do with Jesus Christ because he has the name above every name that's named, that there's no name above heaven or above earth where any man can be saved but through the name of Jesus Christ. There, what will we do with that name? In fact, it's been said of him as he walked this earth and many received him, maybe re many rejected him. Maybe many thought he was nuts. And that's exactly what's been said to him, that Jesus Christ was, was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He falls into one of those three categories in every heart of every man. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or again, he is Lord. Thank you for saying that's a good word, Lord. I think, I, I think you'll see as we go through this, I, I'm hoping, I, most of you here, I'm sure, know he is Lord. But I want you to know why he's Lord. I think it's important for us because how many know there's some Pharisees out there who think he's a lunatic, who may think he's a liar, or who have just have a, a hot mess of mixture that makes him something than who he really is. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a rabbi. He's not only God's son. He is, touch somebody and say, Jesus is Lord. Amen. That's exactly what he is. So I think we're going to see that as we go on. So Jesus now launches into this discourse. And the best way I could put it is, is, is he's, going to, he's going to launch into this discourse about his equality with God. Because if we don't get that part down, you can think he was a great teacher. You can think he was even savior. You can think a lot of things. But if we don't get down that Jesus is God, you're lost. You can be in church all your life, but if we don't get this part of his identity down, we're lost. And so this is where he's going to take them because this is who they've been studying for thousands of years is Yahweh. And here comes Jesus on the scene who was Yahweh in the flesh. And they are going to have some struggles with it, as you know, some of the stories and some that we've yet to see as we go through. He's going to go in the discourse of his equality with the Father. Again, the Bible tells us from Jesus' words himself, if you don't know who I am, you will surely die in your sin. And, and I have to tell you, it caused me to stand back a little. I hope it causes you to, because these guys knew the Bible. See, they knew the word. But they didn't know the living, breathing word of God when it stood in front of them. When we go to the word, we need to say, Jesus, reveal yourself in who you are as the incorruptible seed of the word. You, we, need, we need experience. We need personal revelation and personal encounters with him, don't we? Not just head knowledge or knowing all of, you know, Psalm 31. That, that's not good enough. We have to know him. That's what Paul said. He said, I don't boast in all my knowledge. He said, I boast in what? In knowing him and the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from under the grave, right? That's exactly what he said. So that's where we're heading today. Verse 17 is where it begins. All through the rest of chapter 5. Again, Jesus answered them and said, My father has been working until now. Until now. And I have been working. Okay? What he's saying here is I am equal to the father. I think we have a screen for that. I am equal to my father in purpose. That's what verse 17 is saying. I and my father are one in our purpose. See, what he's saying is my father doesn't take a vacation because it's the Sabbath, right? Guys, see, somebody's got to keep the universe in orbit, okay? That's what he's saying. It's spinning. My father has been working and so am I. Because remember, they got a problem with him because of the Sabbath. So he's saying, my father's been working all along. And basically, I'm coming in now as him doing the very same thing that he's doing. What a thought. What a comfort. 
What a comfort that is. Because that means while you and I are resting at night, while you and I are taking a little nap, he's still working. We sang it today. Even when I can't see that you're working, even when I can't feel that you're working, you never stop working. He doesn't take a Sabbath, okay? He never stops working. He is on 24-7. In fact, Psalm 121.4 says this, Behold, he who keeps Israel never sleeps or slumbers. He don't take a day off, right? That means if you cut your finger on the Sabbath, your blood's still going to coagulate, even though it's the Sabbath day. Right? He's always working. He never stops working. So if God is always working, why should we be worrying? If God is always working, he's working behind the scenes. He's working when you don't see him. He's working when we don't feel him. Why should we worry? Why do we take on the burden of solving problems and situations that we really, frank, quite frankly, can't solve? You know, it's like we've said before, worry's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere. Right? So someone shout out with me, cast your care upon him. Come on, say it loud. Because he cares for me. That's right, exactly. Now watch this, verse 18. Let's see what happens. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. They got it. I think it's so funny that they, you know, it's not a matter of they, were, they just couldn't see it. No, they got it. Because the word tells us here they sought all the more to kill him. Because now he's saying, me and my father are equal in our purpose. Equality, isn't that what we're looking for? He's identifying himself as an equality with Yahweh to them. The Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but look at this last part, but also said that God was his father. Look at this, making himself equal with God. See, we have this play on words. Somebody's a father and a son. Well, that means you're not equal. But see, these people got this. These people got this because he was making himself equal with God. Jesus, it's, it's amazing. Jesus' enemies knew exactly what he was saying. It's very clear here. So that when someone comes along like the Jehovah Witnesses, like the Mormons, like the Muslims, saying Jesus never claimed to be God, and they will tell you that. They will tell you that. Even the enemies of Jesus knew what he claimed to be. We see it right here. Not only does he break the Sabbath, but he continually and repetitively makes himself equal to God, which is what they said, right? He assumed, and we'll, you know, all through the word, and certainly in front of these Sadducees and Pharisees, he assumed prerogatives that are only assigned to God, that are only assigned to God. And he did it not once, not twice, but he did it over and over and over like what? Well, he said, I'm the bread. Anybody who eats of me will never be hungry again. He said, I am the living water. If anyone takes a drink out of my uh, well, you'll never thirst again. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to me except through the, you know, no one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because they're equal. Because they're the same thing. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the Father of one. He is the one who forgives sin. And they said, no one can forgive sin except God. Bingo! You got it. He continually made himself in an equality status with God. We hear that word a lot today, this equality situation that's out there. But this is what we really need to focus on. Because if we don't get this part right, we don't get anything in life straight. We just don't get anything else in life straight. He continually made himself equal with God. Verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. What's Jesus saying here? Well, the first thing he said is he showed himself equal with the father in purpose. Now he says, I'm equal with God in performance. I'm not only equal with God in purpose, but look, he says, I don't do anything unless my father shows to do. That's a performance, isn't it? It's, it's doing something. So he says, not only do I have 
the quality with the father in purpose. I also have a quality with the father in performance, right? His work was a reflection of the father's work. That's exactly what it was. Whatever the father does, the son does. Why? Because they're the same thing. He has to do what the father does because he's, he's, he is God. Verse 20 and 21, let's continue down the row. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel at. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. What's he said? Jesus is saying here, not only do I have purpose equality, not only do I have performance equality, I also have the power that God has. I also have am equal with the Father in the power that God has. Exactly. God has life in him to raise life wherever he is, and so do I. And we'll know that in these stories of Jesus, he certainly did raise people from the dead. In fact, he takes, he said to himself, I take, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to raise it up. So there's equality in purpose. There's equality in performance, and now we see there's equality in power. Do you see what he's doing with these? He's, he's giving this identity, this equality identity, because this is where they're, they're, they're falling apart. They're chasing him doing things and not realizing the one who made the rules is standing right in front of them. Are you with me? Verse 22. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. Isn't that interesting? Here we see not just purpose, not just performance, and not just power, but here we see that he is equal in God with, in, equal in God with proclaiming judgment. Purpose, performance, power, and now we see judgment taking place here, right? It's amazing to consider that. Verse uh, 23, let's see what that says. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. Now, you know that must have got them. I'm sure he saved that one to last because he was kind of building up his case. <laughs> A amen. So if you're equal with God in purpose and you're equal with, to God in performance and you're equal to God in power and you're equal to God in proclaiming judgment, because of all that, you're worthy of honor. You're worthy of praise is exactly what he was saying. I am equal, I am, right? I am equal to the Father in honor is exactly what he's saying. How can anyone say Jesus never said he was God? Look at these portions of scripture right here in John 5. It's all right here. And if someone says that, or maybe if you're confused, you may have come from a background of Mormons or Jehovah Witness, Facebook, you too, uh, or, or Muslim background. This is where you take them because he's spending this whole discord saying, I and the Father are one, and no one can take that away. It's very clear to see. Verse 24, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Who, he who hears my word and believes in him. See, it's not enough just to know the word. Amen. We have to know who the word is. Amen. The word is a person, right? So it's not just my word. It's believe in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Let's talk about judgment for just a moment. I think most of, uh, of us know unbelievers uh, will be judged. They'll be assigned to a very terrible piece of real estate called hell. Amen. But did you know that believers would also be judged? Yes. You know, we as believers are going to be judged too, different than an unbeliever, but nonetheless, we are going to stand before a seat a beam of seat, it comes from a Greek word meaning elevated. It's where rewards were given for athletes and those that did great things from an athletic perspective. They'd be brought up in place with medals and things like that. Well, it comes from that. Second Corinthians 5.10, and they amplified. I want you to see how they amplify words it. For we must all appear and be revealed 
as we are before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we're talking in Corinthians, so this is a letter to the churches. So this is a letter to believers. This is not for unbelievers. With that in mind, let's, let's look at it again. We must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive or his salary, his pay, his reward according to what he has done in the body. Not in your body physical, in the, in the body of Christ, in the bride body, right? What he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive even have been. Isn't that interesting? So that means if you just decided to go to you know, Afghanistan and be a missionary and you just decided to go and you weren't sent, no rewards for that. Now, we're rewarded for what we're asked to do, what we're told to do, where we're sent to go, what he puts in our, our path to do, and what he has achieved, been busy with, or given himself and his attention to accomplishing. You see what this is about, right? This is about the, the believers, the church people, standing one day, right after the rapture, we're going to go to this seat, and we're going to be rewarded or we're going to understand the lack of rewards. Amen? So it's an assessment uh, uh, on what we all do after we're saved. You've been given gifts. You've been given talents and whatnot. What are, what are you doing with them? What am I doing with them? Are we just you know, sitting around intellectualizing the gifts and impressing everybody with you know, our gift knowledge? Are we actually out there in the vineyard of Christ, right? Harvesting Amen. out of the giftings and out of the talents and whatnot that he's, that he's given us. Now, on the other token, unbelievers will be judged at what we call in Revelation 20, the great white throne, where their punishment is forever, okay? And he elaborates this even further in the next verses, 25 through 29. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. We're going to 29. Most is... Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those that hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son and given the authority to execute judgment also because he's a son of man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good, again, to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. So in, so in, in terms of timeline, okay, let, let's look at that. If you're a believer... Your judgment was past tense. Everyone's going to be judged. It's just a matter of where it happens. Oh, this is so, this is good. This is something we have to really understand. We all are going to be judged for sin. Nobody's getting away with not being judged for sin. If you're a believer, what am I saying? Your judgment was past tense. It was taken care of in Jesus on the cross. Uh, okay, do you see that? So you skip the condemnation judgment. You skip the white throne judgment because you received Jesus Christ and your condemnation was placed on him. So your debt is to Telestai, paid in full. I, I want you to understand in salvation, you don't just get to slip away. We all are going to stand for our sin. It's just a matter of when we stand for it. We're out on the timeline. Are we doing it when we receive Jesus and therefore it's, it's in the past tense of our life? If we don't receive Jesus, then it's futuristic. It, it's yet to come yet. Do you see that? 
Our judgment is a judgment of what we did with our gifts and our talents when we were saved. That is the, the, the Bema seat judgment that 2 Corinthians talked about. Very different than the judgment for sin, okay? If you are an unbeliever, the judgment, again, is, 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 is future tense, and we read about that in Revelation 20, the, the white throne judgment. But for us, but for us, Romans tells us there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, you have to imagine that we're hearing this, and some of it to most of you is familiar. Maybe the words are a little bit, help you to understand things a little bit differently or better, give you a better grasp on what salvation is. I'm sure in, in this case, most of you are in that place. But let's put ourselves back in, in where we're at in, in the John 5 narrative. This is a bunch of miter hat, big shot, religious, legalistic, you know, Pharisees that think they're the ones who got it all together and everybody's got to follow their footsteps and everybody ought to do what they're doing. And Jesus is very strategically just cunning into their religious attitude and just sending just different kind of message than they've ever heard or that they even want to hear or even that they want to hear. Verse 30, we're going to stop here at verse 30, but verse 30 tells us, I can of myself do nothing. Again, we're looking at this narrative through the end of chapter 5, in him, his equality with God. So basically what he's saying is, don't look at me. I, I, I'm sent here from another, another, another kingdom, if you will. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. But the will of the Father who sent me. Now, I want to talk a little bit about I can of myself do nothing. Those of us who've studied together for many years, you probably know where I'm going to go, but it bears repeating as we're in this part because some may not know. Jesus, we're told in Philippians, Philippians 2, 7 to be exact, that he emptied himself out of his divinity. It's a, it's a theological word called kenosis. Kenosis. And it literally means the, the relinquishment of divine attributes in becoming human. Now you might go, oh, that's a whole bunch of words. And you know, is that really, what does that matter to me? Oh, it matters a lot to it matters a lot to you. Because this is the state that we can step into in our reality in Christ's position now. Jesus emptied himself at kenosis. He relinquished all of his divine attributes to become like us. See, he had to become like us because in order to be the second Adam, Adam wasn't God. So he had to become a man like Adam that still had power and authority Adam had to go in, right? What did he say? Go be fruitful, have dominion, multiply and be fruitful. That's what he told him to do. So Jesus, in order to be the second Adam, he had to become like Adam, only not sin in the process, which is where Adam brought us all to the state we find ourselves today. So Jesus, according to Philippians, had to empty out, relinquish the divine attributes of divinity to become human. So don't be misunderstood thinking, well, of course Jesus walked on the water. He's Jesus. No, Jesus was a super-duper obedient man who, who obeyed God all the time, who heard the word of God all the time, who only said what God said to say. He only went where God told him to go. He only did what God told him to do, Right? The, the model prayer, I think, in John 17, when he's praying about those that will come after him and the apostles and those, and then even us and believers for all ages, Lord, that they would behave like that, that they would only do what you say to do, that they would only go where you say to go. They would, Yeah, that's the, that's the mission. That's why we have to be followers of Christ because he's a man who got it right. Yeah. That's some good preaching. 
Man, that gets me excited. That's exciting, isn't it, Roxy? It's really exciting because that means, you know, the sky's the limit for us in Christ. When he asks you to go lay hands on some dead person, that means he's given you the ability to do that, just like he did it. Well, I don't know about that. That's pushing a little too far. Well, if you say so. Kenosis. That's what he did. He emptied himself out, relinquished that divinity to become human. That's, that means everything Jesus did here, he, he did under the obedience to the Father and the power of a spirit-filled life. A spirit-filled life. And the good news is today, we can do the same thing. Can you believe that? Do you believe that? Isn't that amazing? We're not just supposed to sit on our, you know, on our sofas. Oh, Jesus, come today, come today, because this is a really bad world, and, you know, we, I don't want to be here anymore. No, we're supposed to be out there doing something about this really bad world. We're supposed to be out there bringing in other laborers into the kingdom and preaching Jesus everywhere we go and, 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 and believing that signs will follow those that believe. In my name, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, do we believe that or don't we believe it? There's not a thing in there about they might recover or if it's my will or if they didn't sin today. No. The same signs and, and, and attributes that followed this obedient to the father man that was spirit filled is how we're supposed to live. Can you imagine if every church in every city on every corner, got this message today, and we actually went out and did it. Can you even imagine? We would shake down this planet like you ain't never seen. Like you have never seen. We're supposed to do those same, same things because that's what he said. The things I do, you will do also. Why did he say that? He wasn't just saying it to be nice to us. He was saying, listen, I came as the second Adam. I came as a man. I emptied myself out as an example to you. Now follow me. Now follow me. And we're going to pick up here next week. I'm going to stop here. Um, because what we're going to go to it, to the end of the chapter is he's going to go into with them why they should believe this. So here, here's the facts. You know, the facts are my equality in all these realms. But here's why you should believe what I'm saying. And that's where we'll go next week. And then we're going to go into chapter 6, the longest chapter in the entire book of John. I think there's 72 verses or something. God only knows how long that will take. But it's, we feed to 5,000 and, uh, you know, it might take about 5,000 years so we can just see each and every one of them. But I want to just share with you one thought as we close today, that I, I just want you to think about this week. The word taught us today that Jesus and the Father are one. Again, Jesus said, if you don't know who I am, you will surely die in my sin. Jesus isn't just a good guy. He's not just, you know, one of, or one of God's, or a bunch of God's sons. No, Jesus is God. And this is where many teachings fall apart. This is where many fall apart. And as I said, Muslims, Mormons, Mormons have him as the brother of Lucifer. Jehovah Witness, he's, he's Michael the Archangel. There, there's so much out there. And it all looks good until you get to this part. I'm telling you, they've been at my door. They don't come anymore. <laughs> they don't come anymore. Because the last time they came, there was a little eight-year-old. I guess they were training him. And we actually looked at this portion of scripture. And I said, and I'm going to pray that this little guy finds out that Jesus is God. And I just put his hand right in my head. and said, you understand? Jesus is, okay, we got to go now. We'll, we'll see you next week. Well, they never came back and praise God. And I don't mean that to be funny because it's sad. It's so sad that, that people are taught these things and they're under deception. And the scary thing of it all is Jesus said, if you don't know who I am, you're going to die in your sin. And if we die in our sin, we're going to stand be before the white 
throne judgment seat and the real estate of hell is what our what the destiny is but there's a couple of takeaways i want you to realize today we don't just get away with our sin because we know jesus sin had to be paid for the question is are we going to allow jesus to be the one that we attach our sin to or are we going to stand before god and think we can handle it ourselves that's what it means to not be saved. It means that you're willing to stand before God someday, although probably most people don't think they're going to do that either, but they are, and you're going to give an account for your life, and it's all going to work out good. It's not. Because one sin, one sin is enough to keep us out of heaven. And how many know there's not just one sin? There's many sins because we're sinners, right? But those of us who have received Jesus, it's simply a matter of our sin had to still get paid for. It's just that the condemnation was on Christ instead of us. So therefore, our judgment is past tense. What a blessing. What a blessing. Oh, my goodness. This is like, this is a story you never get tired of telling. This is a story that every single time, it's, it's, it, it goes deeper, it goes wider, it just gets into your soul in such a deep way that you just should want to just surrender all and just serve Jesus, like, for whatever that means. I love Jeremy Riddle's song, Jesus, take it all. Take the do, take the glory, take my life, everything. Just the longer we walk with him, there should be less of us. There really needs to be less of us. Amen? We should not be identifying with this man on a mat, which remember, this is how this all began. And we're going to see as we continue through the book of John, the attacks upon him, what Jesus went through for us. It wasn't the cross as if that was enough. It was what he went through in his life even, the suffering of his life. The persecution, the, 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 the rilings, the everything. He was perfect in it all. And I just hope we leave this week a little bit more confident in our past tense redemption. Because we are, we are walking in the anointing of Jesus Christ. We're walking in that. But are we living in it? You might know it here, but it doesn't do anybody good if it's just here and here. We actually have to get out there and, and do it. And do it. Who cares what anybody thinks of you? Do we really care? What, do we care what, what Jesus made himself of no reputation? My, I'm so thankful he didn't care what anybody thought. Because guess what? He might not be having this discourse with these foul legalists that were there if he cared about what people think what's the word say i give no you know honor to man what can man do to us what can man do to us amen one other thing i just want to mention is that when when jesus you know we we learned that they're one if you want to know what god looks like what do we do we look to jesus Jesus is the exact representation of God because he is God. So he can't do anything different than God because he'd be a split personality. He can only do what God does because that's who he is. Amen? So when he heals, it's the heart of God for healing. When he wept over Jerusalem, it's the heart of God that he has over Israel. Okay? When he forgives, it's the heart of God to forgive right? When, when, when we're talking to the Lord, our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, family, I, want, I just want to share this with you. We have someone who came to earth who understands all of our griefs, who understands all of our pains. He understands all of our weakness. And Hebrews says, but yet he sins not. He came to earth and he understands all that we're going to go through. But guess what Jesus has that is so amazing? He understands all of our griefs, all of our pains, and all of our sorrows, but he comes with the resources of heaven. 
So he not only relates to who we are, but he comes with all the resources of heaven. And guess what? Because we're in him and we're seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we come to a situation with the resources of heaven also. We don't lack anything less than Jesus had. And I know this might just rattle some some religion here, but I'm going to just say it anyway because I just feel like saying it. So, yeah, so... What I want to say is, because Jesus was the second Adam, right? He's, he's Adam who did it right. And he's seated next to, the, next to God. He's sitting next to, he's in heaven, seated on the right hand of the Father. Do, do you understand that that would have to mean, in order for us to have what Jesus has, in order for us to have this new man reality that we can do what Jesus does, as long as we're with him, because we're seated with him, there, there's a man in the throne room of heaven. A man sits in the throne room of heaven. A perfect one. A flawless one. A sinless one. But not, none less a man still. That's something you might need this week to meditate a little bit on. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? I think I think I just would like us to end maybe just in a moment just of worship a few minutes and then we'll we'll depart. The song we sang earlier, Jesus, your name is power. It's breath and living water. And your spirit guides me to, to the heart of the Father. Isn't that what this lesson was about today? The equality of Jesus being God in all those dimensions that we talked about. And that's what the purpose of him is, is to lead us to the heart of the Father because he is the Father. He and the Father is one. So let's sing that song and maybe with a little more revelation than we had when we started out our time together today.